Thank you, Anna, very much. And uh, my thanks to the organizers of the program for inviting me to be here as well. My name is Tim Shannon. I'm a uh, professor of early American and Native American history at Gettysburg College. And what I want to talk to you about this morning is something known as the Indian fashion. Uh, when we think about early America, we oftentimes, if, if we think about frontier fashion, a certain stereotype will come to mind an image of rude and rustic colonizers, settlers, fur traders, explorers, imitating Indian modes of dress. So think of Daniel Boone being presented in buckskin or Davy Crockett wearing a, a coonskin cap. But the fur trade in early America was premised on actually reversing that equation. Uh, European colonizers expected that woven textiles traded to Native Americans for animal furs and pelts would uh, be part of the process or the project of bringing civility uh, to these Native American peoples. Uh, literally, the uh, process of civilizing the Indians of North America would begin with the process of redressing them, uh, putting them into clothing that would make them more comprehensible to Europeans by having them act, work, and dress like Europeans. And so the model in this regard, uh, as you can see here, is uh, Indian converts. How are Indian converts to Christianity expected to physically embody that conversion? Well, they would cut their hair. They would remove paint and bear's grease from their skin. They would cease tattooing their bodies. And they would cover up their flesh by wearing fitted European-style clothing, such as uh, trade woolens and linens. And we see in this image uh, two very famous Native American converts from the 17th century, uh, Pocahontas, whose story I'm sure you're all familiar with from your uh, grade school and high school history classes, here decked out in full Elizabethan fashion when she visited uh, the court of King James I in 1616 to kind of model what was supposedly happening in Jamestown, the conversion of Native Americans there to the Anglican faith. And then next to her, uh, Kateri Tekawita, who was a Mohawk woman who was uh, pro probably less familiar to us here in the United States, but certainly very familiar to uh, Native American people and um, the descendants of French colonizers of Quebec. Uh, she was a Mohawk woman who was converted to Catholicism by Jesuit missionaries in uh, the 1680s, and she moved with uh, other Mohawk converts to a reserve outside of Montreal. And she here is dressed in kind of the somber clothing that we would associate with a nun, perhaps, of this era, clothing that is uh, covering her uh, from head to toe, that is uh, mimicking the dress of a nun, meant to uh, suggest uh, sexual chastity, uh, humility. Uh, but note also that she is wearing moccasins and leggings of Native American uh, origin. She also is wearing a hemmed undergarment uh, beneath that white tunic that would suggest the possibility of Native manufacture. It might, in fact, be um, a, a deer skin. So uh, in the, by the 18th century, early 18th century, uh, Indians had acquired European textiles through the fur trade, but much to uh, the consternation of Europeans, Indians had not adopted these textiles in a manner that suggested they were interested in imitating uh, your, how Europeans wore clothing. Rather, uh, if, if you read the trade records, if you read travelers' accounts from this era, again and again, uh, European observers refer to Indians wearing the Indian fashion, a hybrid of European goods and native aesthetics. Uh, and in the meantime, Europeans did, in fact, adopt some elements of Indian dress into their lives as well. And the story here typically emphasizes utility. So uh, the most common item of Native American dress incorporated into European dress in early North America were, of course, moccasins. And then a close second, uh, snowshoes, right? Footwear that was designed by Native Americans to better negotiate uh, the, uh, the, the landscape of North America. But there is other evidence of Europeans adopting Native-style dress
during the 18th century, and here we get into some of these issues about appropriation and impersonation and commercialization. In this case, uh, we have an example of the appropriation of Native American dress for the purpose of impersonation. This person is uh, Peter Williamson. I believe this is the first image ever uh, that, that I've been able to find of a British person wearing Native American clothing. He's the subject of the book that I've been working on most recently. He claimed to have been kidnapped from his native Aberdeen, Scotland in 1743, sold into servitude in Pennsylvania. He claimed to have been taken captive by the Delaware Indians and then to have served in the British Army during the French and Indian War. Ultimately, he returns to Britain in 1756 as a repatriated prisoner of war and he begins exhibiting himself in taverns and coffee houses dressed as an Indian telling his story. He publishes his narrative and he, uh, and he actually makes a little bit of a business out of this. By the early 1760s, he is settled in Edinburgh, Scotland. He has opened his own coffee house, which he calls the American Coffee House, and he publishes advertisements inviting people to come see him in the Indian dress. Uh, and if you know anything about 19th century American history, uh, the artist George Catlin, who visits the Great Plains in the 1830s, when he takes his Indian gallery to Britain, he also begins displaying himself in Indian clothing. In some cases, he actually hires Native American performers to reenact some of the ceremonies and dances that are depicted in his paintings. And of course, Buffalo Bill and his Wild West show uh, at the turn of the 20th century uh, is a part of this type of appropriation. There's also the appropriation uh, of of collectors. Uh, and in this image, uh, perhaps some of you have seen this, it's not as widely known, um, I, I don't think, as some of these other images. Uh, this is Sir John Caldwell. He was a British military officer who collected and displayed Native American artifacts and clothing. Uh, he served on the Niagara frontier during the American Revolution. And when he returned to the British Isles, like many other officers who served along with him, he had collected Native American artifacts and clothing. And when he returned to uh, Britain, he, he displayed them in what they called cabinets of curiosities, kind of private museum collections. And when he posed for his portrait in the early 1780s, he decked himself out in all these artifacts uh, that were a testimony to his service among Native Americans in North America. You may have noticed that in both the portrait of Peter Williamson and in the portrait of Sir John Caldwell, they were holding this object. And while this object is not technically a piece of clothing, it is an accoutrement that certainly uh, uh, people who uh, were familiar with Native Americans in the 18th century who wanted to prove their currency with Native Americans would often use. And so Peter Williamson in his portrait is smoking a pipe tomahawk uh, and Sir John Caldwell is using a pipe tomahawk to motion to a wampum belt in his portrait. I love these uh, devices. I think they physically embody the combination of European technology and Native American aesthetics that defined the uh, Indian fashion of the 18th century. It's a trade hatchet, an iron trade hatchet, that would have been traded to Native Americans as part of the fur trade, but with the innovation of a pipe bowl attached to it. Uh, and so this becomes a combined striking device as well as a smoking device. And it becomes very popular in the fur trade in the 18th century and um, as a diplomatic object in the 19th century as well. If you've read Moby Dick, uh, you may recall that Queequeg, the Polynesian harpooner, smokes a pipe tomahawk in the opening chapters of the novel. And Ishmael says he, he, he's, um, he's taken by the genius of the design of this object, which allows you at once to brain your foe in one instant and then to soothe your soul when you feel bad afterward. Uh, and so uh, it, be it becomes an object of diplomacy when it's given as a gift, symbolizing alliance. It also gives tangible meaning to these metaphors that have become a part of our American English idiom, such as uh, taking up the hatchet in terms of going to war or smoking the peace pipe uh, when making peace. I want to talk to you a little more specifically about the nature of the Indian fashion in the Mohawk Valley of 18th century New York. This is where most of my work on the Indian fashion has been focused. And so I'll introduce you to these two figures. Uh, Hendrik Theanaguin, who was a Mohawk uh, leader and chief of the 1740s and 50s, and the Irishman Sir William Johnson. This is a monument to these two men that was installed at uh, Lake George in the early 20th century. 
to commemorate the Battle of Lake George in 1755, where the Mohawks fought as allies with the British. The British commander was Sir William Johnson. Uh, Mohawk, the, the Mohawks were led by Hendrick. Hendrick was killed at this battle and immediately uh, experienced kind of an apotheosis in British letters. The, he became a hero of the British Empire. And because the British managed to hold their ground in this battle, William Johnson was knighted and he was catapulted to significance in British North America as the Crown's appointed superintendent of Indian affairs in the northern colonies. And what I like about this image is it's very, it's very much a stereotype that you'd expect to see in the early 20th century, particularly of, of, of the Mohawk Indian, uh, Hendrick, who's actually wearing his hair in a Mohawk. Uh, and he's, he's kind of half naked, he's got some leather leggings on, and he's got this kind of deer skin, animal hide draped over him. And then there's Sir William Johnson dressed in what you would consider to be the stereotypical costume of a British gentleman of this era, a tri-corner hat and uh, vest, waistcoat, uh, and, and, and britches, and so forth. But in fact, if this statue was going to be accurate. It should depict the two figures exchanging their clothing with each other. Uh, and we know that if we, if we read the, um, some of the textual records about these figures left behind by their contemporaries. William Johnson, who was originally from Ireland but settled in the Mohawk Valley, became renowned among his contemporaries for his influence and intimacy with the Mohawks as evidenced by his willingness to participate in their diplomatic councils and to outfit their war parties. Cadwalder Colden was a prominent New York official and the author of the first history of the Iroquois published in the English language. And he described Johnson's entrance to a 1746 treaty conference convened in Albany in this way. He said, Johnson entered the city's gates riding at the head of the Mohawks dressed and painted after the manner of an Indian war captain, followed by Indians likewise dressed and painted as is usual when they set out to war. And listen to some contemporary descriptions of Hendrik Thayanaguin. Johnson's partner in much of this diplomacy and this alliance between the British and the Mohawks was likewise known for dressing in European clothing when he was engaged in diplomacy or warfare with European allies. So uh, Dr. Alexander Hamilton, who's not the Alexander Hamilton we're much more familiar with uh, from the Revolutionary Era, he was a, a traveler from Annapolis, Maryland, who happened to be on tour in the northern colonies in the 1740s. And while he's in Boston in 1744, he actually witnesses a parade of Mohawk Indians coming into Boston to engage in some diplomacy. And he says, we were called to the window by a parade of Indian chiefs marching up the street. The fellows all had laced hats and some of them laced match coats and ruffled shirts and a multitude of the plebs of their own complexion followed them. This was Henrique and some other chiefs of the Mohawks. This Henrique is a bold and intrepid fellow. And after Hendrick's death at the Battle of Lake George, a map published in London described him as Hendrick, the Indian chief or king of the Six Nations who was dressed after the English manner. So clearly from these contemporary accounts, we know that Hendrick and Johnson were engaged in something we might call cultural cross-dressing. That in order to prove their influence, in order to gain uh, uh, power, both uh, with their own people and among people on the other side of the cultural divide, they would dress in the style of the other side. Where, where is this practice coming from? It's not unique to them. It's rooted in this amalgamation of European trade cloth and Native American aesthetics that their contemporaries called the Indian fashion. And so these images are a series done by a French engraver in the late 18th century, but I think they do a very good job of illustrating what exactly the Indian fashion was. It was, um, it, it varied according to status and according to gender. So uh, Indian chiefs were known as for dressing in laced hats, sometimes in regimental coats. They wore peace medals around their necks. Uh, they often had uh, elements of trade, silver armbands, wristbands, gorgets around their necks. In other words, these are not supplicant converts, humble converts who've gone over to Christianity and now dress like humble peasants. They are dressing in a very proud and regal manner. Uh, warriors favored woven textiles from European traders that they wore as breech clouts. They favored accoutrement like uh, tomahawks, knives, again, peace medals, silver arm and wristbands, uh, and even paint uh, that they acquired from European traders rather than making themselves domestically. 
And Indian women favored what was commonly known as stroud cloth, which were basically trade blankets, woolens that were manufactured in England and exported to America. When worn around the shoulder, these were often referred to as match coats. We might think of them as a mantle or a cape uh, today. Uh, also, they wore them as shifts draped about the waist. Uh, Indian women also valued um, European tools, all blades, scissors, and razors, and materials like thread, lace, ribbon, and brass wire that they could use to manipulate this cloth. They preferred to get the, the cloth off the bolt rather than having uh, finished products because it was easier for them to work with. Overall, the Indian fashion had several distinctive qualities. Indians prefer fabrics that are cut from the bolt rather than finished uh, products so that they can manipulate and modify them. Indians prefer to wear clothing that is draped around the body rather than closely fitted. Looser fitting shirts and shifts and match coats are the most common example of that. Indians were inclined to dress like Europeans most above the waist and less likely to do so below the waist. Uh, they did not like wearing shoes. They did not like wearing uh, breeches or stockings. Uh, Indian men and women like to customize clothing, clothing by adding stripes, ribbons, or lace. They liked to um, manufacture jewelry, such as nose rings and earrings, out of trade silver. Uh, also, they would work with brass wire and copper salvaged from other trade goods like kettles to uh, modify their clothing. The Indian fashion was something that you not only saw, but you also heard it coming down the street because of the use of tinkling cones and other kinds of silver and brass objects that were attached to the clothing. Uh, and in general, the Indian fashion left more flesh exposed than Indians would have preferred. Quite clearly, they're using European manufactured cloth, but they are not dressing in the style of their European contemporaries. Now, the practice of cross-dressing becomes very important in diplomatic relations like the kind that Hendrick and William Johnson are involved in. Johnson's influence uh, came in part from his use of gift giving, the gifting of clothing and other goods to uh, Indian chiefs, warriors, uh, and women. And also clothing was a very important means of nonverbal communication, uh, a way of projecting, for example, hierarchy. So think back to Dr. Alexander Hamilton saying that the chiefs wore the nice laced hats versus the multitude of plebs of their own complexion, right, the, the, the more plainly dressed men who followed them. Uh, and in this little exchange here, uh, we see an example of kind of the, the interpersonal dynamics of gift giving and how clothing helped negotiate alliance. So William Johnson in this exchange is dealing with an Oneida uh, chief named Nickus, who has come to Johnson angered by the fact that uh, two Oneidas had been murdered by some fur traders. And Nickus, to show his disgust, strips off a scarlet laced coat, gorget, laced hat, and everything Sir William had given him, and threw it all down at his feet and said he would not wear them any longer as his regard for the English was now at an end. Johnson told Nickus, it surprised me to see you, whom I looked upon as one of my sincerest friends, cast away all the marks of distinction in regard which I had given you heretofore. Johnson then gave Nickus 10 black strouds, 10 shirts, seven silk handkerchiefs as condolence presents to cover the graves of the murdered Indians and returned to Nickus all of his clothes and jewels so that he would rest easy in his mind. So we have a, a strip tease in which Nickus strips off his clothes to show his lack of regard for the English. Johnson then renews the alliance by using gifts of clothing as condolence gifts to cover the graves of the murdered Indians and then literally redresses the grievance, the grievances by redressing Nickus, by returning uh, more clothing to him as a way of kind of visually restoring this alliance. By the time of the American Revolution, the Indian fashion was so commonly recognized and regarded that even um, European artists are incorporating it into their paintings of Indian leaders. Uh, two very prominent Iroquois leaders of the revolutionary leader were the Mohawk Joseph Brandt, who you see here, and the Seneca uh, chief corn planter, both of them having their uh, paintings done in the late 18th century. Both, by now, there should be elements of the Indian fashion that you recognize here, both carrying pipe tomahawks, both exhibiting trade silver and gorgets around their necks, 
both wearing mantles or match coats draped about their shoulders, both of them also wearing Native American headdresses. And the Indian fashion also persisted among non-Indians, but interestingly enough, mostly among the British, not so much among the Americans uh, during the Revolutionary Era. And we see that here in this portrait of Guy Johnson and a Mohawk named Karagan Yanti. Uh, Guy Johnson was the nephew of Sir William Johnson. Sir William Johnson died in 1774. Guy Johnson took over as the Crown's Indian superintendent, and he visited London in 1776 to uh, uh, draw some support from the Crown for loyalist Indians and colonists who would continue to fight against the Patriots in the Mohawk Valley. And he had his portrait painted by the American artist uh, Benjamin West. And you can see in Guy Johnson's clothing here elements of the Indian fashion. Moccasins with quill work and leather leggings, a beaded sash around his waist, beaded garters on his legs, a fur mantle uh, draped over his shoulders, a wampum belt worn across his chest, just below his neck cloth, and there's also a wampum belt being worn uh, by his Indian companion. And he's holding in his hand a Native American cap decorated with beads and feather work that would approximate the headdresses that were worn by Corn Planter and Joseph Brandt in the previous images of them. So that is the uh, Indian fashion in the 18th century. I'll close by just noting for you that it does live on today in, um, in some very interesting ways. If you've ever attended a reenactment uh, from the 18th century, places like Fort Niagara have these big summer reenactments, uh, reenactments every year, or, uh, Fort William Henry or Fort Ticonderoga, there are still uh, craftsmen and women who are both native and non-native who engage in beadwork and finger weaving and cloth working to approximate uh, this clothing. Among the Iroquois themselves, uh, we are reminded of the Indian fashion by an annual custom involving their treaty relationship with the U.S. government. In 1794, the Pickering Treaty, or Treaty of Canandaigua, was signed between the federal government and the, uh, and the Six Nations, and it promised the delivery of an annuity of treaty cloth every year. Originally, it was calico. It was changed to muslin many years ago. Now, in the modern era, federal agents have offered to convert the delivery of these cloth boats, uh, bolts of cloth, to the Iroquois every year to cash payments. It would make it much easier to do this. But the Iroquois refuse, and they insist on receiving the cloth every year, which they cut up and divide amongst themselves. This annual ritual is a reminder of the social and political value that the Indian fashion had in the 18th century. The cloth was the cloth was never just about protecting the body from the elements. Rather, it was about negotiating as free and equal agents with non-Indian neighbors and retaining a sense of cultural autonomy in the face of colonization. So the cultural appropriation of clothing was a two-way street in the 18th century. And we look at its historical roots in this period. Uh, the Indian fashion is a visual testimony that uh, it wasn't just Europeans borrowing from Indians, it was also Indians from borrowing from Europeans, each side exhibiting a degree of autonomy and sovereignty as it engaged in this practice. Thank you.